Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Cynthia Smith, and to give you a brief visual description of myself, I'm a white woman with curly silver hair. I wear round eyeglasses, and I'm sitting in my office in the museum in front of a shelf uh, that are filled with design books. I'm the curator of socially responsible design at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York. I organized our current exhibition, Designing Peace, which is on view until August 6, 2023. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Designing Place, Considering Power, which is held in conjunction with the exhibition. Please visit if you haven't already. We'd like to thank our supporters who made this program possible, including the Ford Foundation, Lisa Roberts and David Seltzer, the Lily Auchincloss Foundation, Helen and Edward Hintz, and the Barbara and Morton Mendel Design Gallery Endowment Fund. Before we jump in, I wanna share some logistical details and accessibility information for our program. We have live captions available for today's event. You can access those, all of those by clicking the closed caption button. I think it says CC on your Zoom menu and clicking show subtitle. My Cooper Hewitt colleague, Alexa Cummins, will be your point of contact for accessibility today. She'll say hello in the chat now. If you have any accessibility issues, you can send her a private message in the chat and she'll be able to help you out. For today's program, we encourage you to use the chat box to engage with your fellow attendees. Throughout the program, feel free to add questions for our speakers via the Q&A icon. Today's program will run for 90 minutes. It's being recorded and will be posted on the Cooper Hewitt YouTube YouTube channel next week. In today's talk, our speakers will explore the importance of place and power when designing for public dialogues and spaces and how these sites of engagement might initiate peace, justice, equity, and at times creative confrontation. First, we'll have a series of short presentations and then we'll have some time for a moderated discussion along with Q&A from the audience. John Rubin and Don Walensky will share about their Pittsburgh-based Conflict Kitchen. Jonas Stahl will present on New World Summit Rojava located in Northern Syria. Brian C. Lee Jr. will discuss his paper monuments engagement in New Orleans. You can read the, their impressive biographies for each of these speakers in the chat. And I do, do hope you'll come visit to see each of their important creative collaborations, which are on display in the Designing Peace exhibition. It's here at the museum. Now also we have a digital version online. You can also read about more about these, uh, this work in uh, related publication, Designing Peace, Building a Better Future Now. It's my pleasure now to introduce you to our moderator, Jamie Bennett. Jamie works at the intersection of nonprofits, philanthropy, and the public sector, engaging the arts, culture, and community development. As a former executive director of Art Place America, a 10-year initiative that invested $150 million in some 250 projects across rural, suburban, tribal, and urban communities throughout the US, projects that enlisted artists as allies in cultivating equitable, healthy, and sustainable communities makes him uniquely suited for today's conversation. Over to you, Jamie. Thanks so much, Cynthia. I really appreciate it. 
Um, hey everyone, Jamie Bennett, he, him pronouns. I'm a middle-aged white man with short salt and pepper hair, glasses, earrings, wearing a gray shirt and sitting against the white background. I am um, calling in from Toronto, Canada, whose true name is Takaranto, where the trees stand in the water. These are lands that are stewarded through the dish with one spoon wampum and are subject to Treaty 13. They are the past, present, and future lands of the Mississauga of the Credit, the Mississauga of the New Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And as Cynthia said, we're about to have three amazing presentations of projects, um, following which we'll have a brief conversation among the panelists and then hopefully engage all of the voices. And just looking at some of the attendees who are here, I see some brilliant friends and minds, um, you know, uh, Jessica, Priya, Susan, Sakshi, um, Patty. So please feel free to engage in the chat, add your voices, ask questions, we'll keep an eye on that. So with that, I think I get to invite John and Dawn, the two creators of Conflict Kitchen, uh, to come join me on camera and share a little bit about your work. So Dawn and John, feel free to introduce yourselves, however you'd like to enter this chat, and then take us on a little bit of a tour of Conflict Kitchen, if you would. Sure, I'll start off. Um, so I'm John, I'm a, a white male. Um, I've got mostly gray hair. Um, I'm in my office and behind me uh, is an artwork that has the words marigold, Mount Kilimanjaro, and moonlight. Um, and Dawn, maybe you can introduce yourself and then we'll we'll get into the presentation. Sure. Hey, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're calling in from. My name is Dawn Molesky. Pronouns are they, she. And I'm joining you from unceded Oneida Nation land, one of the six nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy here in rural central New York. And I am a racialized as white person uh, with blue eyes, joining you from my kitchen with a very comfortable um, black hoodie, one of my favorite uniforms to be wearing. Um, and the kitchen, one of my favorite places to be. And John and I are going to share with you today uh, our Project Conflict Kitchen, which took place in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania from 2010 to 2017. And John will start us off. So I'm just going to share my screen and share some slides. Okay, um, so we're, we'll give a kind of brief overview of the, the project and um, kind of maybe dive in on a couple of moments with in the life of uh, the work. And then, you know, we're very open to having uh, dialogue and uh, answering any questions uh, after the presentation. So as Don said, the project occurred in Pittsburgh in the neighborhood uh, called East Liberty, which is a long-term black working class neighborhood uh, in the city of Pittsburgh. And the uh, project was located in a storefront in, in that neighborhood. If we can maybe go to the next slide. Um, and in sort of like it's, Maybe simplest form, Conflict Kitchen was a restaurant that operated from 2010 to 2017 every single day that um, sold food from countries the United States was in conflict with on a rotating basis. So in our initial location in East Liberty, we had a kind of uh, temporary facade or I guess permanent facade placed on the side of the building that shifted its identity in relationship to the cuisine and country we were focusing on. We're looking at here um, Cuba, Iran, Afghanistan, and Venezuela. And one of the goals of this project was to bring to the street um, conversation that many Americans, many Pittsburghers might be uncomfortable having about countries that they might be entirely unfamiliar with um, and cuisines that they might never have eaten before. So the 
exchange uh, at the window of the storefront and of itself was a kind of performative space, but also a place for the distribution, not only of food, but uh, the food was wrapped with wrappers that contained interviews with people from each country that we were working with. Uh, <clears throat> it's important to note that this is sort of a series of uh, publications that we would distribute over the years, books, interviews, uh, speeches written by um, some of the people living in the countries that were a focus. So the project is very much just a collaborative platform. Um, it was developed, here's a, sort of the beginning of our Venezuelan version where members of the local Venezuelan community are there for a taste testing. Um, it's important to note that the project worked with people in the countries that we were focusing on, but also in the sort of larger diaspora and in our city specifically. Um, so this is our Venezuelan version and uh, our Afghan version. This is a new venue that we moved into after I think two and a half years. Um, and we went from being in a smaller neighborhood that had fewer folks coming, maybe 20 or 30 people a day to on a sunny day like it is today in Pittsburgh, about three to 400 people and kind of shifted the model of engagement that we were able to, um, to have. Uh, the recipes, this is, we're cooking in a, um, a woman's uh, collective in Palestine, I'll set a novelist, uh, learning how to make maftoul. And um, so recipes, again, came from uh, travels, but also came from local communities that we were working with, and specifically in this iteration, our Palestinian community here in Pittsburgh. And this is uh, before the Palestinian version, again, another taste testing. My friend Ahmed brought his mom from Gaza who had, you know, sort of modifications to the recipes, which was a kind of perpetual process of recipes being kind of shifted um through the perspective of every everyone who's you know kind of cooked the recipe um we also hosted a whole series of events and programs and educational um uh platforms this is a meeting with the local sudanese community outside a kind of lunch gathering that we would have on a daily or weekly basis rather um, lots of virtual sort of engagements um, right now with Zoom. It's, I, you know, really don't feel like doing anything virtually, but in the pre-Zoom days, we did an Iranian virtual cooking lesson. We also did a North Korean version of this. People joined from all over the world. Uh, we realized there were a lot of people waiting in line often, and there was a kind of captive audience. So we initiated a lunch rush trivia show um, in which people started to engage in questions and uh, the, with the culture and cuisine of the countries we were focusing on. Um, and slowly over the years, what started as a very small project with just a few employees grew to um, an initiative that had probably over 20 people working for it and a education and outreach um, component that reached into all the, or not all, but was available for public and private schools in our region. Uh, again, working with people from our uh, community. And oftentimes, as John mentioned, we had this sort of captive audience waiting for their takeout food, right? We're utilizing within the stream of everyday life this typical, typified American capitalist concept of the takeout restaurant. So it's something that you would you know, presumably understand the protocol of you go up and you order, but then we would usurp that order and that protocol and say, with your Iranian food, perhaps you would like to have that with Sorab Kashani, but you're going to be doing that through the body of Elise Walton, one of our Conflict Kitchen staff members. So the foreigner, which is a tongue in cheek way of saying, who do we call the other or the foreigner and what is foreign to us? Um, whether we're talking about place or or person or senses of identity and um, what is uh, authentic and what is genuine, um, we sort of use the foreigner as a way to have that discussion. So you could eat your food with Elise and speak to Sorab through us a microphone. So as the staff member um, was had a set of headphones on and could hear Sorab um, live in Tehran, the community member who was eating their food was mic'd up and could ask Saurabh any question they would like. Saurabh could hear the question and Elise using a technique in linguistics and in translation called shadowing would repeat exactly what Saurabh was saying as he was saying it. 
And then you would hear the answer through the body of Elise and would continue to have a conversation, albeit one person removed. So there became a layering of sexuality, of gender, of political affiliation, religious affiliation, um, and of space and time, of course, which for a lot of Pittsburghers, it uh, gave them an opportunity to perhaps um, have a conversation that they might not typically be encouraged or um, feel as comfortable to have. Um, so we were oftentimes playing with that notion of um, bringing a uh, perhaps what is an uncomfortable conversation for some to a more curious place so that instead of inheriting um, our own opinions from family members and friends and the news and media, perhaps we need to challenge where those misconceptions uh, that are sometimes come from. And that included working with uh, several other iterations, including a Juneteenth iteration where we were approached by Black and African-American chefs and home cooks within Pittsburgh to offer their cuisine. Um, so for several Junes, uh, we did offer Juneteenth cuisine where we pointed not only to the food that we were making in the kitchen, but to the many Black and African-American owned businesses throughout the Pittsburgh region where you could get um, your greens, uh, you could get brisket um, and things like Trinidadian doubles, which most folks weren't necessarily associating with Juneteenth cuisine. Um, and as Conflict Kitchen went through many different iterations, North Korea and Palestine, um, Afghanistan, we also needed to look at how our foreign policy was created as a nation state. And that, of course, is um, due to the genocide, um, uh, almost genocide of many indigenous people, the stolen land. Um, and the land um, that, that we were on in Pittsburgh, which was not uh, flooded due to the preservation um, uh, or the creation of a dam, which flooded then Seneca Nation land. Um, so we presented a Haudenosaunee um, iteration. Um, this is current um, Haudenosaunee uh, reservations throughout the five and six indigenous um, uh, Haudenosaunee nations. And then here is just a space, since we're talking about place and power, um, a location on the border between New York and Pennsylvania, which shows the Allegheny Reservoir and River and the Kinsua Dam, which was built in the lower left-hand corner. So that Pittsburgh was able to, um, after a flood in 1936, um, retain some um, level of security from that flooding due to the building of the Kinsua Dam which misplaced or displaced 600 Seneca families, um, took away a third of their land, um, much mo most of which was uh, their fertile land. And so our Haudenosaunee presentation was called Joheko, which in Seneca language means corn, beans, and squash, the three sisters, which we presented at Conflict Kitchen, which a lot of our customers who are used to what is a typified sandwich in Pittsburgh, the permani sandwich with your meat, your potatoes, and your vegetable all on one sandwich, often found the Haudenosaunee cuisine, which is the most local and the most indigenous. Here we're serving uh, venison, deer meat, potatoes, thyme, uh, berries, as to them the most foreign. So again, constantly playing with what is, what is the other, or what is foreign to, to one in their daily life, when in fact, folks are our neighbors and we're on um, perhaps stolen land. And so we oftentimes were looking at the food as not only uh, medicine, as a technology, but as a way to refer to the sovereignty of the people and of the land that we were on and would offer products, including the Iroquois white corn projects, uh, corn, roasted white corn flour, where we're really looking at the, the food as a technology um, with which to maintain that sovereignty and would oftentimes also use um, the food as a, as a methodology for uh, highlighting workshops and the technology of how the food um, maintains, again, the people um, and sustains the people. And I'll just leave you with a, with a quote from some of the olive oil bottles um, that we purchased um, in bulk and then repackaged um, from a farm in the West Bank. Uh, from the farmer, I am challenging the occupation by living only off the fruits of my land. And in this way, the land itself is empowering me to resist. And so that's what we have for you today. And I'd love to pass it on over to Jonas. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, 
my self-identification, my introduction, uh, I am uh, I use he, him pronouns, but I definitely prefer comrades, which is not uh, so much of a pronoun, but a, uh, a gender neutral designation of a desire to stand on the same side of a collective um, struggle. Uh, I'm a white man, I'm 40 years old, I wear big glasses, I have brown green eyes, I wear braces, um, and I am currently speaking to you from Athens in uh, Greece. I will uh, introduce a, a project called the New World Summit. For that, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, which is an artistic and political organization that I founded in 2012. And the aim of this artistic and political organization is to create uh, parliaments for stateless and blacklisted political organizations. So here you see uh, the design of such a parliament with flags that belong uh, to organizations that are placed on so-called designated lists of terrorist organizations. This was the very first New World Summit Parliament and created in uh, Berlin, in Germany, in 2012. Here you see that the flags are organized by color, creating an arena in which we invited representatives of these uh, organizations to, uh, to come and speak. Now, being placed on a terrorist blacklist means that uh, once uh, uh, bank accounts are frozen, um, uh, passports are revoked, a travel ban is uh, imposed, essentially you are declared stateless. And this is a, a very cynical fact because many organizations on so-called terrorist blacklists are already stateless organizations. So here we have uh, the gathering of representatives from left to right, the Basque independence movement, the Kurdish women's movement, the Filipino underground movement, the uh, representatives of the Keltamashek, better known as the Tuareg, that fight for independent uh, state in the northern part of Mali, the Sahel uh, and uh, um, the Sahara Sahel region. So many of these groups um, are already stateless organizations, uh, a struggle for their right to self-determination. So to place them on a, on a blacklist means that they are essentially double negated. You are, uh, the stateless are declared stateless. What for us was very important, and when I say us, I speak of the team of architects, designers, people from the field of progressive diplomacy and law with who I create these temporary parliamentary structures here an impression from the new world summit in brussels in 2012 for us what was critical was to develop uh, this project in a period um, uh, in which the the war on terror and the dominant narratives of the war on terror were haunting our politics and and i speak specifically of the so-called us versus uh, them narrative we wanted to ask who exactly uh, is this them? What constitutes them, the so-called terrorists, the reason why uh, my country included the Netherlands had joined the coalition of the willing for the illegal invasions of Afghanistan, of Iraq, later of Libya, with terrible long-term, decades-long consequences uh, as, a, as a result, and millions of people, um, uh, largely civilians, who were uh, murdered. So who exactly is this them? And is it possible that uh, what supposedly constitutes us uh, the states, the, the nation states that, that act, claim to speak and act in our name, that the real problem is not uh, what is considered uh, terrorism in terms of uh, relatively small scale uh, organized uh, militants resistance, but that the real structural problem is state terrorism. The war on terror itself is a form of structural uh, state terrorism. Here are some impressions of uh, the New World Summit Parliament that we created in uh, Utrecht in the Netherlands in 2000. And, uh, uh, 16. So could we create spaces, these parliaments, where we could recompose what exactly uh, constitutes us and what constitutes them? Maybe it's the states that, uh, that, that lead this imperialist war that should be considered them. And maybe we, uh, citizens who have rejected the war uh, from the very, the, war, the ongoing war on terror from the very beginning, maybe we have more in common with the groups that um, that are, are uh, prosecuted and that, that are uh, often through paralegal means um, in the war on terror. Maybe we have more in common, maybe we constitute more of an us, of a collective, uh, than, this, uh, than the, the war on terror narrative uh, presupposes. 
So the space, in a way, this creation of these parliaments in these different shapes, circle, oval, here there's, a, there's more kind of tri triangular, semi-broken semi open space that, that builds on uh, morphological genealogies like the one we know from the House of Commons in the, in the UK. These spaces are essentially trying to partake in that recomposition of the us versus them narrative to uh, take down, deconstruct a dominant propaganda narrative and try to create a new one. And as such, um, I, I, I've come to believe that, that spaces are very much uh, participants. Of course, at the place where you gather, its, it's history uh, partakes in, in many ways. Um, there's always already presences in an assembly very much before we gather to assemble, and that's important to acknowledge. Uh, then the space that we construct, the spatial conditions of assemblies, and uh, this, also, this, also part, this also partakes to this construction of the possibility of a new uh, collective. Here in the case, the New World Embassy of, uh, of Rojava, uh, a series, part of a series of temporary embassies that we create for uh, stateless and, uh, and blacklisted organizations to develop a form of non-state or stateless diplomacy. This was uh, built in the municipal house of, uh, of, uh, of Oslo. So uh, the morphology of the space, circle, triangle, oval, uh, um, the, um, the division also of, of light in a space, uh, who, is, uh, who is through light enabled to speak, who is not. The difference of the use of chairs, which tends to, to individualize people, to declare them individual sovereign islands versus uh, the use of the bench, which is predominant in our construction. The bench has a long history in utopian architecture. A bench is full with one person on it, but also with 20 persons on it. The bench is a space of continuous democratic negotiation, a place where we can make space for others. We tend to think in, in extreme details of how space partakes and enables uh, assembly. Now, a very um, uh, close collaboration of the New World Summit has been the autonomous uh, government of, uh, of Rojava. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Rojava means West in Kurdish. It uh, refers to the Western part of Kurdistan, Northern part of Syria. Kurdish people known as the largest nation without a state. And in uh, Rojava, the past uh, years since 2012, actually since the founding of the New World Summit, there has been a, a revolution to establish a new autonomous territory um, under a model that uh, the Kurdish revolutionary movement describes as a form of stateless democracy a way of practicing democracy without the construct of the state based on local communal self-governance, gender equality, and communal uh, forms of, uh, of ecology. And um, the Kurdish revolutionary movement, the representatives of, uh, of Rojava, they part participated in the uh, New World Summit from the very beginning. Here you see Amina, also the co-chair of the Council of uh, Foreign Affairs of Rojava, a close uh, contact and partner who invited us, our team, to come to Rojava and to develop together with her a new uh, parliament that would celebrate this model of stateless uh, democracy that the Kurdish uh, revolutionary movement for decades had uh, struggled for and was able to realize in extremely complex uh, conditions under the threat of the Turkish regime on one hand, under the threat of the Islamic State uh, on the other. So we attempted a as a collaboration between the autonomous Rojava self-government uh, and our team. We try to think how does this new model of status democracy, how does it translate um, morphologically? Um, here you see so the, some of the designs that we developed together with uh, Amina. Also here you see the beginning of the building of the parliament and that establishes its, its very specific relationship to Kurdish territory, to Kurdish uh, soil from there. An agora uh, arises, a circular space of, uh, of gathering that emphasizes that in the Rojavan model of stateless democracy, it is collective self-representation that is central. Uh, for Amina, it was very important that the parliament would be a public space, that it would not be, the parliament would not be separated from the public space, but co-constitutes the public domain, and that the space between um, Rep the, the, the person temporarily chosen to represent the community and the presence of the community itself would be as small as possible. This is what, uh, this is why we use this term of collective uh, self-representation. That there's an, 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 an intimacy in the building um, performatively and politically 
uh, of uh, this um, um, of the, the practice of uh, of stateless uh, democracy. Uh, here you see uh, the images of the parliament that was uh, opened in uh, 2018. Continues to be in use, although currently it's under renovation. Uh, there is a parallel uh, Rosevan parliament that is currently operating in uh, in the Netherlands, where other coalitions between Kurdish movements and the Zapatistas, as well as activist movements like Extinction Rebellion, is being established. And as such, this is a, an attempt uh, to partake through artistic morphological competence, the thinking of the forms through which we uh, assemble and through which we try to uh, organize ourselves in a, in a very direct, uh, you could say, political intimacy uh, with a revolutionary movement. That brings me exactly to 10 minutes. This was the time that was uh, given to me as the limitation for the introduction. And I look forward um, to discuss uh, with all of you and uh, uh, our fellow panelists, my fellow panelists. And it is now my pleasure to introduce to you Brian C. Lee, Jr. Thanks, Jonas. And as Brian is just coming on camera and sharing his slides, I'll just share that Brian woke up this morning largely without a voice. And so he's going to join us as much as he can today um, without pushing himself. So Brian, share whatever you would like to share. And we look forward to seeing the images and being with you a little bit. OK, uh, um, thanks for bearing with me here. <clears throat> So I'll start by saying um, my name is Brian, Brian Lee, and I am a Black man sitting in a hotel room in Cambridge, Massachusetts, with a maroon shirt on and a um, short Caesar haircut. I'll keep it quick. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a project called Paper Monuments. And this is a project that was founded in the aftermath of this nation's kind of pursuit to remove racist monuments from the landscape of our built environment. And so in New Orleans, in 2015, we started a series of organizations that uh, really sought to do that. Some, some were direct activist organizations. Some were artist organizations. I'm going to talk to you about the kind of arts and public space organization that came out of that, uh, or at least pr project that came out of that called Paper Monuments. Um, some people ask, why is it called Paper Monuments? Mostly because we didn't have any money and we thought paper would be an easy way to uh, reach as many people as possible, but also to not solidify a new idea in the face of something that had already been uh, 150 years in the making in our given cities. Robert E. Lee sat for 150 years in the center of New Orleans as one of the tallest monuments in the city. And Robert E. Lee had never been there. So how do we create an opportunity for many people to have uh, a series of, of, of um, imaginary opportunities and to put those proposals back into the world and uh, accumulate those and represent them back into the public. So a little bit of context. Um, that time was very contentious in New Orleans. We had a lot of the racists that you saw in uh, Virginia and across the country would travel from state to state, but they really started here uh, in 2015-16 um, and were pretty violent. Um, they didn't uh, murder anybody while they were in this particular city, but they did carry guns uh, around at every event. And they were very kind of public about that um, threat. So that was one of the things that we were dealing with uh, as organizations as well, how both to challenge a larger system and to deal with the kind of acute malice that was proposed or threatened uh, in that particular moment in time. Um, so Paper Monuments became a project that was about imagining what new monuments might look like to the city, what stories were not being told, what stories were under wraps or been buried over time, and how do we lift those stories, the, <clears throat> the stories 
stories of teachers and of coaches and family members, the ones that are often negated in our larger context of history. So I'll talk to you a little bit about how we set up the system. <clears throat> we worked to use and utilize all of our uh, kind of public transit systems. We posted up at bus stops, at train stops, and posted a lot of posters, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, we used our public libraries consistently all across the city. We use our public institutions, cultural institutions across the city. We talk to our schools and universities across the city in mass. And we activated public spaces in mass. So all of these dots that you see here are interventions, either static interventions, of artwork, or uh, public interventions of activities or events that we created. So in doing so, we created a process in which we gathered posters and proposals for people, over 1,500 proposals over that time. Um, and we collected those stories and made them into these kind of beautiful posters, put them back out into the public. So it wasn't a dialogue or a conversation between us as designers and the public. It was a conversation amongst a public itself. Right? Uh, and so we took those conversations, gave people other opportunities to have uh, input, and started to aggregate that narrative. <clears throat> so whether it was about culture or families, or the legacies of women in the city, um, we wanted to make sure that it was visible and visible all the time. One of the ways in which we did that was to activate as many authors and storytellers as possible, as well as as many artists, contemporary artists who would translate and take those stories and make them um, relatable to a contemporary environment, both in 2D and in 3D. But we'll start with the poster designs. Again, we started with posters because there were so many stories that were coming in that it meant that we needed to, to find a consistent but beautiful way to tell all of those stories. So we had over 75 different stories told, 75 different art pieces made um, to reflect these different um, events, collectives of people, places, and movements that happened across the city. One of the things that we were adamant about is not uh, elevating or buying into the lionization of singular individuals and making sure that we acknowledge uh, the collective act of city making, of place making is one that is indeed collective, and not singular uh, in its own right. So we tried our best to kind of expand that. Um, uh, I'll tell a quick story, uh, one of these, maybe two of these. The desire standoff on the left-hand side here is uh, September 15th, 1970. The Black Panthers had nearly 200 police officers and four tanks come to attempt to eliminate their headquarters, the kind of cultural center. In doing so, they shot, they shot up this house with elders and with, uh, uh, with young people existing within that space. Luckily, no one was harmed. The community came together, rallied, put arms together and wrapped the building and pushed back the officers, pushed back the kind of impeding force. Um, there were no guns on the Black Panther side. It was mostly an assault on that community. So one story I like to tell about this is, you know, this is one of those stories that doesn't often get reflected in our city. But when we started to post it in public, we there was a, uh, sorry, a, a civil worker downtown who saw this poster. He was a street cleaner. And every lunch break for three months, once he saw this, he said, I was there at this event. And he would stand outside 
and tell anybody who got off the bus what happened that day. So again, these became these kind of monuments to these stories that, that were significant to the shaping of, of New Orleans. Uh, Dorothy May Taylor, I helped to desegregate Mardi Gras in the mid nineties. Um, the Claiborne kind of uh, uh, innovation district, Claiborne Highway cut through the oldest African-American neighborhood uh, in, in New Orleans and the oldest African-American neighborhood in the country at the time. And uh, ultimately is a flexion of a black neighborhood that was divided as a byproduct of this kind of systemic violence and has struggled for 60 years to find its footing. Um, so here are just some of the, the kind of global or public posters that we, we pasted. These were public events that we did with people. Uh, maybe 30 or 40 people would come out. We, we'd paste across the city or we would make these smaller kind of civic posters that we would hang up in the given locations in which these events happened. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do with the, the, this part of the project was to allow for the weather, for time, for people to occupy these narratives. And so as you see on the sassy servants, sometimes there are things that obfuscate our, our narrative and our stories and our histories. Uh, and that is a byproduct of the way that we live with this built environment. But it also means that we can find ways to um, unpack and tell these stories in multiple different arenas. So the last two parts of this process were a way to take those visuals that people gave us in proposal form and create these kind of contemporary collages um, in which we start to future set. What would it be like if these proposals were made real? What would it look like if uh, New Orleans, a city on water, uh, was depicted in a real fashion? What would it look like if a gramophone that was constantly playing histories and narratives of New Orleans uh, replaced Robert E. Lee, the kind of <clears throat> Confederate leader at Lee Circle? What does it look like if we honored enslaved people's uh, origin point and what they, they were as humans before being enslaved? What would it look like if we really used all of the kind of cultural notions of our city and brought them to bear from uh, the kind of education spaces across the city to second lining with uh, the one down here on the left hand side that you see says dance and feathers. Um, we then started to explore how we expand that. How do we get larger? We started to ask again, multiple artists to kind of support uh, this effort. And we started to make these kind of paper-based but larger three-dimensional uh, monuments, basically. So you see another one to the uh, raid in the desire, Black Panther raid. You see these little portraits here in the top right by the bayou in New Orleans that were talking about stories of people who were either existed in this space for a long time. Uh, and or passed away. And on the bottom left, you saw a monument of a series of these little books that told stories of people from two sides of a city and allowed us to kind of understand these mini monuments, these mini narratives as the, the effective uh, type of monument we wanna see moving forward. And the last one you see on the bottom right is uh, a story of um, the kind of cultural community of Algiers Point in New Orleans uh, across the, in the West Bank. Um, lastly, I'll, I'll, well, lastly on this part, I will talk about uh, this beautiful piece on the right-hand side um, by Lydia Stein. Um, Post-Katrina, sunflower seeds were strewn across the city, and so they grew out of they grew out of the refrigerators that were on the side of the road. They grew on top of buildings. Um, they were a symbol of resilience. And so this piece was a reflection of the resilience of the people of New Orleans post Katrina. Um, and then we started to move into kind of physical space uh, monumentality. This is one uh, piece on the right hand side that is a lenticular 
um, that worked in combination with the African American Museum to bring attention both to their you know, relaunch as an institution, but also to talk, talk about the weaving of the Germe at large, both the highway, the uh, African American Museum, and uh, Congo Square, which is adjacent. And so the next phase of that project, which we are contemporary or we are currently in, is called the Storia Project. So the way that this works is that we went from posters to uh, markers to monuments. Uh, and now what we're building is pavilions, so these public civic museums. Uh, Dejembe is a public cultural displacement um, uh, pavilion. It talks about the displacement of culture uh, in neighborhoods. Uh, and starts to reroute some of those uh, articulated cultures within that space. This is called the Defrag House. This is about neighborhood displacement. So what happened to the stories and the narratives of people? This is in combination with the African American Museum in New Orleans. And this is called Story of Delta. It is a reflection of ecological displacement and indigenous uh, communities. So this piece will reflect on those narratives and stories with Lafitte Greenway, um, Nord, and uh, New Orleans Redevelopment Authority, or sorry, Recreation Department, and the Lafitte Greenway. Um, I think I've run out of voice, so thank you for giving me a little bit of time and energy, and uh, try again in a minute. <laughs> Thanks. Brian, thank you for that. Get a tea or whatever you need. And Dawn and John and Jonas, uh, I invite you to come back on the camera. Um, for everyone who's been watching and listening and paying attention, feel free to jump into the chat. Would love to have your thoughts, your questions, your observations. And I think maybe the place I'd love to begin with you all is <clears throat> it's always interesting to me when a sort of curator comes in and brings sort of her frames to a set of projects and sort of sees what they have in common. And in some ways, place is kind of an obvious one. All of you are doing projects that are about people in place. And I've sort of found place to be a, a particularly squirrely topic. I don't sort of quite know how to define it. I don't know how to think about it. And Dawn and John, you know, in our prep call, when I sort of said conflict kitchen, you know, why did you set it in Pittsburgh? You both sort of said, well, because that's where we were. But I wonder, as you think about that project, how important was it? How much was it taking place in Pittsburgh, a factor that shaped it? How much was it different when it was in East Liberty before it moved to another neighborhood? Just talk a little bit about sort of how, however you're thinking about the places where Conflict Kitchen has been, how that informed and shaped the project. Go ahead, Don. Do you want to start? Sure. Um... Well, I'm I'm born and raised um, in a rural area just outside of Pittsburgh, and most of my adult life was spent in in the city of Pittsburgh. And so it was for me the project very much a part of coming to understand the levels of of ignorance about place that I had in a place that um, even though my family had been there for four and five generations. Um, and we're very much a part of the blue collar communities within the city and um, and surrounding areas. Uh, I didn't know much of the history um, or I had a version of the history that was just plain incorrect. And so Conflict Kitchen was an opportunity for, I think, John and I in a lot of ways to do a lot of learning um, through uh what through conversation and you using food as a catalyst for that conversation, which oftentimes, again, those uncomfortable conversations or the discomfort moving to curiosity was something that we very much were doing and working towards. And so Pittsburgh was important because it was, uh, I had to work through a lot of my own misconceptions of, of my neighbors and place and sense of land and, um, and yeah, John, for you. Yeah, I mean, I think that covers a lot of it, but there's there's also something about making a work in the city in which you live every day. I mean, the um, the restaurant was always just a couple of miles from where we lived. Um, and the restaurant is like a living, breathing, daily entity that is, I think, um, 
the beauty of it is it's a kind of mechanism for a call and response with the public, which seems to be something that each of these projects in varying forms engages, right? Is sort of a kind of porousness, um, a sort of provocation or question put into the public sphere and then a response and then a, um, and then a you know a conversation back. And so, you know, when we started, I think uh, we, our first focus was on Iran. Um, people started coming up to the restaurant telling us what we needed to focus on next once they figured out what the premise was. Um, there was almost like an organic quality that happens by just being there on a daily basis, um, coming up with programs and ideas and platforms that hadn't existed in our city. We could only know by being in that city. Um, you know, of course, you're always like a call away when the fryer breaks, but, you know, additionally, you're there when like a, a difficult conversation arises and you need to find a way to uh, create a public forum to address it and how the project can and cannot be that place. So I think that was really important. You know, I've done work and I think we all have in, in cities outside of our own, but there's a kind of um, organic gathering of momentum and um, and relationships that happen in a city you live in. Thank you for that. And Jonas, I, I particularly loved um, your sort of uh, discussion of the sort of seat as an island, the bench as sort of the thing that connects us. And in many ways, that's sort of how I approach cities because, you know, I used to live in New York City, but really I used to live in Brooklyn. Really, I used to live in downtown Brooklyn. Um, which are related, but but not synonymous. But the, the frame I'd love to invite you to jump in with, Jonas, is, you know, this is an exhibition called Designing Peace. And you are working with a set of folks and a set of placeless peoples and a set of nations where peace is not the sort of first frame that necessarily many folks would sort of put on that. How do you think about the, the sort of new world summits as adding peace to the world is not adding, you know, is that a frame that you would have chosen for yourself as, as you're thinking about this project? Um, no, but what I really liked about, I mean, what I really like about Cynthia's framework, first of all, it's that it's like, a, it's a framework of a big mind because to st start talking about designing peace, it's kind of, it immediately, it's immediately a provocative form because it asks the question is peace something that can be produced and under what and under what conditions and what is the role that uh, artistic or design practices like what is the role that cultural work plays in prefiguring the imagination of peace um which i think at the, at the part at the moment of time in which we are the radicality of peace is evident it's the necessity and an urgency to speak and 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 uh, think of militants form of peace um is uh, the necessity of that is, uh, is is very apparent then there's also the question of the um how we how we create the visual and formal and spatial conditions and how these can and and how these contribute or can these contribute to the, the possibility of uh, of peace and, and here I'm always a little bit conflicted because, of course, I mean, when I was uh, uh, traveling in Syria, I saw the roundabouts which uh, had been transformed depending on where which uh, which territory you were in the territory still under control of Assad, its father Assad uh, and, and the current uh, and the current leader of the regime in areas that had recently been liberated from ISIS, these same roundabouts, the same structure, the colors had been changed into black and white and the tiles and cages had been placed to exhibit uh, prisoners that would later be executed. In the Kurdish territories, those same circular uh, roundabouts were colored, were, were paint, repainted in the colors of uh, red, yellow, and green, which are the central co color central to the, to the movement with uh, depictions of uh, uh, martyrs uh, that had sacrificed in the struggle against ISIS. And each of these roundabouts really represented something fundamentally different um, and, and its infrastructure played a different role in telling the story of that difference, but it was st still that roundabout. So um, just because you uh, make benches circular or you divide light equally doesn't mean that the people who are gathering um, uh, an egalitarian space does not necessarily make egalitarian people, but it isn't necessary part of it at the same time. So it contributes to, but it is not a guarantee towards peace. And I think that that just says something about the modest role that we as artists and cultural workers play in the fact that we cannot and should never think that by and of ourselves, we design peace. We partake in broader movements, broader popular movements, broader political organizations. Uh, and in that we play our 
relative importance, but very relative uh, part in the bigger whole. Thank you so much for that, Jonas. And I, that notion of sort of prefiguring peace or sort of dreaming the peace we haven't yet um, experienced. Brian, I often think the sort of twin of that kind of dreaming is excavating the past that's been papered over, that's been intentionally erased, that's been sort of pulled out. And I'll sort of, I'll, I'll offer you the sort of third P that Cynthia offered us, which is power. And, you know, monuments are a very specific form of power in America. Paper is an interesting thing to sort of fight. Um, power with and just talk a little bit about sort of where does power lead you to 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 want to talk about in in the work that you're doing yeah <clears throat> yeah um you know we often talk about power as a, a reflection of both the land mass that we are living on or with and the policies and procedures that are applied to that land, right? And so, you know, when one gets the opportunity to occupy space and monuments do just that, they occupy these like moments and they leave residual traces. And the, the power, powerful thing about monuments is that they are simply logos, right? They don't necessarily tell you the story of, of a particular individual or event. What they are is a symbol, affirmative symbol of power. Right. And so when someone, and this is the thing that we we had to deal with at Lee Circle, people didn't necessarily agree with the Confederacy or didn't necessarily agree with Robert E. Lee, who owned 190 enslaved people, but they stood out there for 40 years during Mardi Gras. Mm -hmm. And this space, this thing became a part of their identity even if the meaning of, of the space didn't attach to their identity, right? And so they find themselves um, kind of trying to support or justify power. Uh, and it's amazing how like simple it is to get people to kind of justify the violence of power just so that they can feel comfortable, just so that they can kind of stay within that, that framework. And so I think, it has a, you know, for us, paper was a couple of things. It meant that we could flood the zone to some extent, right? We could uh, tell so many stories that this one story could get, we could lessen, we could weaken its power a bit. Um, and then the other part of it was that we could get more people to engage, if not in their own stories, in the kind of multiplicity of stories of the people that they might relate more to, right? And so in doing so, getting them to honor and understand their own power relative to that situation, because it wasn't up to us to change the, the outputs of, of a 150 years of the city. Like we, our job was to see whether or not the city itself, the people of the city wanted a different format, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was the that was the tool by which we did that. Um, and we always go to like the Malcolm X quote that says, you know, all revolutions are based in blood and land. It is the landless versus the landlord. And that like quote about how we think about land and how we think about the landless is extremely important because it talks about placelessness. It talks about who owns place, who can drive place uh, and the kind of nomadicism of people who don't get to own land who don't get to control place the easiness of which uh, those people can be moved us <laughs> we can be moved uh from place to place so i think there's that and then the last thing i'll know is um Par polygon allen has a quote that says uh uh ch -ch -ch the loss of culture is the root of all oppression right the loss of cultural memory sorry is the root of all oppression and Part of our kind of theory was that if the loss of all cultural memory is the root of all oppression, then the kind of persistent and willful pursuit of memory making and memory keeping is the is a formula for how we defeat that oppression, how we dismantle oppressive systems. 
narratives, right? The kind of constancy in which we keep um, those narratives and those stories in public make it real. So anyway, yeah. that's well, thank you for that, Brian. And I sort of I love the um form follows fiction tagline on some of your slides and sort of you know combating fiction with truth. Um, questions are starting to come in the q and I'm going to get to them in just a second, start weaving them in. But all three of these projects push against power in some pretty important ways. And all of them have been met with controversy, right? They have not been universally loved. Not everyone has sort of greeted them with unicorns and, and rainbows. Um, let me just go in the same order, but you know, feel free to jump in. Dawn and John, was there a particularly difficult moment that stands out during the course of Conflict Kitchen? Was was there a moment of real sort of controversy or danger, whatever that means, or sort of, was there a moment of conflict that you think is especially notable to thinking about that? Um, I mean, yes. But we also are clear to not have that define the uh, uh, sort of mission or identity of the project. Um, so the voices of, you know, in our case, you know, sort of uh, a group or uh, anyway, I'll, maybe I'll talk about the situation that happened and we can kind of contextualize it in a larger um, way. Uh, so we focused on Palestine. And I think like any artist or intellectual or individual who's in the United States or in, in other countries as well, but specifically in the United States, if you if you focus on a Palestinian-centered narrative with Palestinian voices, um, you're going to come up against a very large um, and organized effort to um, silence those. And so, uh, you know, during our Palestinian iteration, which was no different, you know, in its focus than, say, our North Korean or our Iranian one, it, you know, presented the thoughts and views and opinions of people living in Palestine and Palestinians living in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, we started to basically be attacked in the media, which is sort of standard thing. It got kind of picked up in, in the right wing media. Um, in terms of a kind of specious set of relations between uh, a grant funder of ours, the Heinz Endowment. So Heinz Ketchup is produced in Pittsburgh and one of our funders. Um, but the sec uh, Teresa Heinz was married to the Secretary of State at the time, John Curry. And so there was a lot of sort of like using our tiny little restaurant in Pittsburgh to basically throw uh, Curry's efforts in the Middle East, which are basically not reflective of ours or Palestinians, but to throw them, you know, um, into disarray and specifically Breitbart and Fox News running articles, you know, that uh, Secretary of State funds radical is anti-Israeli, anti-US eatery. Um, you know, I had people behind the scenes trying to get me fired from my job at my university. Um, one of the things to note is that the project uh, operated through a research center at my university so that the employees of the uh, restaurant are employees of the university and had benefits the university could provide. But, you know, that protection, you know, once you come against, you know, certain narrative forces is quite thin. Um, we received death threats, had to close the restaurant. Um, there was a very destabilizing and uh, environment for uh, our employees. Um, and I think, you know, again, this was a moment in time, you know, we were, it's a seven year project. Uh, we continued the Palestinian version, um, you know, and re, uh, constituted it in many different iterations into the future. But, um, yeah, you know, our goal was just, you know, we're serving food and telling stories of people that, um, you know, don't need to be countered. Right, you don't need to hear the Israeli side of a Palestinian's viewpoint on government policy. Uh, and frankly, we're probably over inundated with that na narrative. Don, what stood out for you? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jamie. I I think in addition to the the conflict with our Palestinian iteration, 
the the project ended for a number of reasons, but um, at one point our staff unionized. And so therefore the university, because the staff were university employees was taking on yet another union. And uh, we had contract negotiations for almost a year. And then about a year after that, the um, we had to end the project in terms of our relationship with the university. And so I would say that after seven years, we became an institution nestled within another institution um, that because of the um, because of the lack of flexibility due to the growth of the project and it further embedding itself into capitalism uh, actually became the demise of the project in a lot of a lot of different ways. And so when Jonah speaks about, you know, political intimacy and when um, when Brian speaks to to storytelling and and collectivizing that storytelling, you know, there were there were points when we probably should have shifted um, the direction of the project um, or perhaps the structure of the project. And uh, so that led to a lot of interpersonal conflicts, conflicts within the project, conflicts between individuals and institutions affiliated with the project. And uh, it's it was a deep learning experience for me personally and as an artist. Um, and it's it's one I continue to to learn from and grow from very much. And Dawn, just before I go over to Jonas, uh, someone was wondering, does Conflict Kitchen live on other than its documentation? Will it happen again? Is, you know, what what are your thoughts about sort of the future of Conflict Kitchen? Uh, there's there are no plans to to reiterate it in any in any way. And in fact, there have been many versions or iterations that, that folks around the world have have taken up on their own. Um, there's a version in Poland, there's a version, and there's different iterations have popped up um, it, previously or continue. And it's, that's great. The idea is that the, you know, in terms of this notion of ownership or concept um, or the notion of food as, as, an, as a tool for, for sovereignty and storytelling, um, that's certainly uh, not something that, that we're the only folks that, that have done or can do. Um, and we encourage others to to continue on with that with that legacy. Thanks for that, Jonas. You your project, the the New World Summits, deal with many of the same peoples and countries that were also represented in sort of Conflict Kitchen, and you were sort of engaging them as a group and in a global context. Talk about some of the controversies you've experienced. What are some of the political ramifications? Just help us sort of widen that aperture, if you would. Yeah. I mean, yes, I think that, let's say the, the territories of conflict kitchen and new world summits partially overlap. Of course, they are fundamentally different because state the people struggling for their own independent state or right to their territories um, have a different geography that is currently not acknowledged in the in the in the world map. I mean, it's it's I I'm very happy to be part of this to be in this panel because I think there's a lot of questions related to organizing. Um, and the vulnerability of organizing that uh, that are very specific to yeah, very particular kind of artistic and cultural cultural practices. So I, I recognize a lot from uh, the controversies that uh, John and uh, Don were just uh, narrating. I mean, what are the con con the controversies that we're facing? The controversies that are the result of the widest possible paralegal nets that um, the U.S. and its allies, including the Netherlands, have cast. Uh, in order to create a perpetual war that wants to build to create a, a utopian peace of a, a terrorist free world but is actually itself a machine that continues to produce more terror this must be this is the ultimate paradox of the war on terror that it creates exactly the terror that was almost unimaginable before it started like if the islamic state would have been depicted depicted in a film pre-september 11 it would have been banned immediately as the most kind of racist idiotic um, like uh, Orientalism on crack type of representation of a supposed terrorist organization, but the 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 this this kind of dark imaginary of the, the, of, of the war on terror produces exactly this kind of agents that even go beyond its what it thought uh, uh, terrorism is or or could be. Um, 
this wide net that the, that the war on terror um, has uh, paralegal net that it casts, uh, we we have been confronted with it as well. Me and several of, uh, of our fellow members have uh, our we have uh, uh, travel bans imposed. I've not been allowed to travel to the U.S. since uh, since 2015. Of course, this is all very relative to many of the the, the, uh, the limitations, structural limitations, and violences, systemic violences that the organizations we work with are facing, because we still have functioning passports for most of the world, and that's. That's that's uh, that's already a lot, but of course the, the strategy of the war on terror, what was uh, what was launched, maybe even more specifically with when the white papers were passed passed under the Obama administration, is that the broadest possible association with so-called terrorist organizations, uh, blacklisted organizations, is already a reason um, for um, for for being banned from appearing in in the in the public realm. And, and appearing means access to political institutions, uh, access to, to banking systems, access to, uh, to structures of mobility. And I think this is where maybe, as Don was, was pointing out, where I do indeed see, see, a, see a connection that I guess our, our counter organizing work is to try to build histories and alliances. I think in the case of Conflict Kitchen, a kind of non-aligned alliances even, or more than aligned, differently aligned alliances to build our own infrastructures and histories and narratives with which we can systemically counter these, uh, these forms of, uh, of system systemic uh, uh, violence. Um, and that maybe provides a relative form of safety and solidarity and, and comradeship um, in order not to be dissuaded from the very beginning to even enter to engage these questions in the first place. Um, as, as John was pointing out in relationship to, uh, to uh, supporting um, the Palestinian rights to uh, self-determination, which, which basically equals, uh, equals boycotting your, yourself, your future career, uh, your access to, uh, to funds and, and you name it. And, and this is very recognizable, but the more of us refuse to partake to the narrative, the stronger, that, uh, the stronger that we are, the more chance that we can create a relative peace within our community. Great, thank you, Brian. There's actually a much better question laid out in the Q and A than I was going to ask you, so I'm going to I'm going to pick that up. And someone sort of began sketching out a little bit of a sort of theory of change, which is you sort of start with a blank piece of paper, you turn it into a piece of art. That piece of art begins to create a social change. That social change can become a sort of narrative cultural change, and maybe if that is overwhelming enough, there's a political change. When you sort of think about sort of the journey from the piece of paper, blank piece of paper to the permanent change that you want to see in New Orleans, just talk a little bit about sort of how that works or, or what that brings up for you. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I'll try. Um, so, and if at any point you want to call a timeout, yeah, yeah. feel free to call a timeout. And yeah, I appreciate we'll it. Shift. Um, okay, two, <clears throat> two continuums that I often work with are... One is the continuum of memory, which essentially states that our memory can impact both the uh, pedagogical, political, or procedural systems that we're engaged with through uh, an activation of memory itself, through momentums, like small little tokens, um, then through the media, like the media as in the paper that we created. Um, markers, monuments, but these are all steps in creating interventions or activations. <clears throat> and each successive one both builds power within the collective community and directs, ho hopefully, starts to direct that power with a nuance, I'm sorry, direct the kind of people power with a nuance to where those systems are that are controlling, right? And so, you know, as, as I showed you, you know, we started with the paper, but I showed you those pavilions that we're working on presently. Those pavilions give us an opportunity both to hire community members to be a part of processes around displacement and housing in the Treme, right? Um, they give us an opportunity to talk about ecological displacement across the city of New Orleans, subsidence. Um, and it rallies people. It's a, it's, a, it's a rallying point. So we tend to think that creating spaces um, is a kind of a, well, some people tend to think that creating spaces are neutral conditions and whatever happens in the space is what happens in the space. But 
we kind of believe that these activations and these pursuits around creating space, moving from the small intimate space of handing someone a paper and that space being wrapped around them to a much larger space like a pavilion or a museum are our political acts that give people the space and time and opportunity to both understand and acknowledge the systems around them, unpack the systems around them, but also give them a chance to um, organize to challenge that power. Right. So, yeah, so I think I think those that that is our kind of theory of change relative to that. Um, and I think it's it's really interesting to be a part of a community that has been historically disinherited or disenfranchised from public spaces, uh, from owning houses, from all of these kind of uh, built environment conditions uh, and recognizing that if we wanted to see any change, it's not gonna happen by way of just dropping a new community center or dropping new housing into a community. Um, it's gonna happen by building the trust that leads you to that. And building trust means that you have to be in conversation. Being in conversation means that you have to start small and non-transactional. You know, non-transactional can lead to then more trusted, larger transactional uh, engagements down the line. But if you don't build that trust, then none of it happens. And so we thought paper, transactional, we give people a gift, basically. Uh, and we build relationships. And then it gets to where it gets. Beautiful. Um, Dawn, you did a little bit of this in the in the Q&A, but I, I want to invite this into the spoken space as well. All of your projects take place in public space. And we know, Brian, exactly as you sketched out, that no public space is neutral, is universally accessible. So as you think both about sort of physical accessibility, as you think about welcoming, belonging, safety, Dawn, what does the sort of designer self in you, how do you begin thinking about making spaces that sort of achieve that continuum of access, welcoming, belonging, stewarding, or, or however you would sketch it out? Just anything you wanna share here in addition to follow with Kelly and writing. Yeah, I, I think, you know, when, Brian mentioned moving away from the transactional or being able to build up to a place where then the transactional is a collectivized protocol, right? Where there are expectations and there is some level of trust, which of course is always ebbing and flowing. It's trying to create or inter interlope into spaces that are possibly overly transactionalized and are, are working with modes of production instead of reproduction. So if we can, as Jonas was pointing to, move in solidarity towards more reproductive methodologies, um, which sometimes means stopping and pausing um, and backing off and also allowing for a lot of grace and also allowing and building in time for breakdown, right? and antagonism and allowing the agonism to move to antagonism, which I think a lot of our work is about continuing to, to poke and prod at some of these things so that, so, that, so that the violence is at the surface, but also maintaining time for there to be rest, you know, in the seasonalities of organizing, as, as many folks talk about, it, this too has to occur within a reproductive practice as a designer or an artist or an architect. Um, and I found that to be quite tough personally and, and certainly working with others uh, on projects in this way. So I don't necessarily have any answers, but as, as John also talks about, we, there is this ecology of participation. And in doing so in that way, when we think about that ecology, and when we think about power, my question is who is being centered in that power, right? Who is deeming themselves to be the host of something, to be the arbiter of um, invitation? And that, that I think gets really tricky. Um, a, a friend, Ren Agarwal, who is an architect and socially engaged artist often speaks about um, reproductive spaces also building in exits. Um, or and and I think that's that's a good one as well. So those are just some some provocations for discussion, but don't really have any answers, just more questions always. Well, and Jonas, I'd love to come to you. I was fascinated by your talking about the different shapes you use and sort of 
the triangle, the parallel benches, the circle. When you sort of think about that, you know, when you think about literally who gets centered, is there a center? Just how how do you think about those shapes? How does that, just talk a little bit more about that bit of it, because I, I found that fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's also, it's, it's, a, it's a set of questions that I've, um, that for me have, have been central also to to a lot of to my work in uh, in social movement uh, organizing, um, and that is how uh, what 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 kind of morphology morph morphologies what visual forms do we associate with particular political concepts and can help to enable them, like the 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 circle which is a shape that we very often fall down fall back to is of course is is probably one of the most tricky tricky ones because it's the shape that creates the quickest sense of collectivity but also has the quickest hierarchy of um of privilege in terms of who was in the circle first before someone else entered when you're in a circle it's it's a highly egalitarian and inclusive space but when you are uh, arriving at the circle and you weren't part of it from the beginning it's a wall it doesn't have a so like there were often morphologies that we assumed have this um, democratic appeal or potential democratic working, is it that partake to the building of uh, of radical democracy? Um, but then sometimes spaces like the one that I showed in the in the of the New World Summit in Utrecht, which was much more fragmented, seemingly oppositional, with these kind of strange diagonals breaking through, allowing for much more ent entry and access points, um, actually worked better than what as an image works uh, what works uh, um, as, an, as an image of democracy so like, the circle always works as an image of democracy it doesn't mean that it necessarily works how we want democracy to work and sometimes there there are also strategic considerations because organizations that uh, that that i work with and in some cases i'm also an active member or part of and um, there's of, of course also the image the image we want to propagate the, the, the claim to an alternative power that we want to propagate through the building of these parliaments and embassies and, and these alternative infrastructures uh, and the point where how they work visually as an image in the world runs counter to what we want to happen inside of them. So there, there's also a continuous um, uh, tension between the, uh, the reality of presence, the use of the space at the moment that we gather in the parliaments, uh, and the question of representation. We want that image to operate on a whole other set of levels, and we, we want it to propagate our own alternative counterpower um, uh, to an existing uh, existing political uh, system. So there, yeah, all these all these considerations cross each other uh, all the time, and, and probably also speak to this fragmented notion of of presence and that 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 we are never present present only in a singular way. We are present always in a variety of senses. Uh, it makes me think of the, your earlier question on place. And I was thinking, yes, indeed, there's there's a place and my place in the Netherlands where I am part of different political parties and social movements and, and, and do my work there. But I also I'm also I also have a place in ideas and in ideological narratives. And that makes me suddenly makes my loyalties uh, uh, across many other geographies and suddenly have less to do with uh, with the place where you were born and maybe touches closer on a notion of expanded comradeship that builds around the ideals and the imaginaries that you're trying to realize into the into the world. So just as place has this multiplicity of manifestations, I think with presence and representation through the spaces we create, that's, that's, that's similarly the case. Good, thank you. I'm really, I had never thought about sort of triangles and diagonals and I've, I've got to design an event in a couple of weeks and I, anyway, I did, thank you for that. Um, so we are dangerously close to ending this event on time. So I want to see if I can mess that up with just this sort of quick exit question for you. Um, and let me just go, Brian, John, Jonas, Dawn. What's the thing that you're sort of working on now? What's occupying most of your mental space? What's giving you the most excitement? What's something that's sort of front of mind for you, Brian? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah we are, we're working on a project. <clears throat> Damn. <We're>, uh, <laughs> so lozenges, lozenges are the thing that are front of your I'll mind. Back. I'll come back to you. John, what, what's, got, what's got you occupied these days? Uh, several things. Um, uh, I'm currently creating a kind of uh, fictional uh, national museum that can be cited in every state in the United States that allows 
the public to conceptualize what we should be commemorating, what we should be imagining into our futures. Um, so it's a kind of large scale project, but that will happen at a series of local spaces. Jonas, how about you? What's what's on your to do list? There's many things, but the, the, what I'm very closely to close closely working on now is a collaboration with uh, lawyer Rade de Souza on an alternative tribunal that we've created. We call it the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes to prosecute um, climate crimes perpetuated by states and uh, corporations. And we're organizing, preparing a series of public hearings now in uh, in Guangzhou, in Korea, that start next week, that specifically focus on the intersection of war crimes and climate crimes. Uh, and the case that we're trying to make together with various um, uh, peace activists and climate movements uh, across uh, across Korea is that um, it's not just it's not just waging war, but it's the very existence of the military industrial complex that is a climate crime. Um, and I think that 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 also touches or this attempted analysis, this attempt to prosecute an infrastructure. Um, that even if it doesn't wage war, its very existence and its fossil reliance is a is a forms a kind of perpetual form of um, well extinction war you could say against against the living human and non human alike. Um, I think this touches maybe on this on the question that we're addressing here the, the the question of peace and the radicality of peace and the fact that that you know when when you were asking in the beginning also about peace I, I was thinking where is there peace. Because countries that we term as being at peace tend to heavily rely on um, waging war elsewhere. So uh, their war is our peace, or uh, their 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 subjugation to to systemic extraction um, is what uh, is is what 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 facilitates this uh, this supposed peace that we're living. So peace must must mean the dismantling of these of these very infrastructures of the war machine of the criminal fossil. Uh, fossil um, uh, machine. Um, the, the, our, our understanding of peace has to has must relate, I think, to these infrastructural questions, and that's that's why I'm so obsessive, both in the work with the New World Summit and the work with Rada on these climate tribunals, on on also making infrastructural proposition, prosecuting these the infrastructures that maintain a world at war, where war is normative, um, and to propagate infrastructures that at least at least could maintain the imaginary of the possibility of peace as the minimum, let's put it this way. Thank you for that. Dawn, where's your momentum taking you these days? What's next? Um, since 2018, uh, in my current locale, we've been organizing and I co-steward an organization called Emergency NY or Para Organization. That's a regional mutual aid network um, that services people with goods and services during times of ever present crisis, however individuals here define crisis. And we're looking to finally, after we just received a little bit of funding um, to shift one of our working groups into activation. It's called Spectre Theater and it's a community theater company where the ghosts of the of uh, that have created uh, situations of violence on this land and on this earth um, come back to life and are grocery shopping next to you at the price chopper sitting next to you in the hourglass bar. Um, and they're, you know, just back to check on how things have been going. So how did that policy work out? What were the consequences of my actions? Um, and speak to people uh, improvised in everyday life to just help them to, again, admit ignorances perhaps and uh, reformulate different versions of our histories. And that will all be, uh, I walk along as a scribe during this time and all of that goes into a script that will be played as a um, a la Orson Welles's War of the Worlds radio theater um, in our mutual aid ambulance. Um, and that will be broadcast through our pirate radio, our ham radio, and through publications and other devices. So stay tuned for that. Pirate radio, Orson Welles. I love it. All right, Brian, last word. What's what's uh, what's taking you to Cambridge or, or what's keeping you busy? All right. So I get to teach a class at <clears throat> Cambridge right now that is a class on Black Reconstruction and the Harvard Legacy of Slavery Report. So our ability to kind of challenge the 70 people that were challenged the kind of Harvard institution as they enslaved 70 people 
um, from their origin. <clears throat> um, so that class has been amazing. And uh, the second thing I'm doing is we are designing the Claiborne Innovation District in New Orleans, which is a 19 block cultural marketplace uh, in the Treme. And this is a project that is the culmination of 60 years of activism uh, that challenged the highway that cut through the center of this neighborhood, this historically black neighborhood, eliminating uh, jobs, education, uh, you know, health outcomes, educational outcomes, wealth outcomes, all of that. Um, and we're building and organizing a kind of storytelling campaign around that history, colorizing old photos from the neighborhood, and then building all of that into place uh, over the next two years. So that is the, the most pressing project and the most fun. So if you come to New Orleans, come see me. When you come to New Orleans, when absolutely. You come to New Orleans, come yeah. See me. So I think the only thing left to do is Dawn, Jonas, John, Brian, thank you so much for sharing so wonderfully over these past 90 minutes. Cynthia and your colleagues at the Cooper Hewitt, thank you so much for giving us this space. Anyone who is going to be in New York City before August 6th can go see the exhibition in person at the Cooper Hewitt. Anyone who's not going to be there, there really is a wonderfully done um, sort of digital experience of the exhibition online if you go to the Cooper Hewitt website. So with that, thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of your days wherever you are. Uh, and we'll see you soon and hopefully over a delicious piece of food. Um, great. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.